that stuff <laughs> on. We need to get emotional up there. Or smell a belly. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody this morning. Are there any announcements that anybody has? Ooh, 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 ooh. ooh. Yes, sir. After much consideration and deliberation and lots of conversations and trying to figure out how best to serve this church this year during Christmas Eve, all that we will have on Christmas Eve is a come and go communion service. I will get here uh, early that afternoon and prepare and set up the sanctuary. And then from about uh, 5 to 6.30, just as folks uh, with their families, whoever is here wants to, I will be here to serve communion to everybody that comes through. I'll offer prayer, a little pastoral prayer for everybody to gather. Uh, we'll, have can we'll have an opportunity for people to light candles. And so we'll have small candlelight service, one family at a time if necessary. But uh, just because of just the way things are this year, uh, the difficulty and trying to, to get enough people here to actually have a service and come and go to communion this year, we'll just be having uh, come and go communion. And I hope by next year that so much of everything we've had to put up with this year is behind us. Uh, that with uh, Pastor Mike, uh, next year we'll give you opportunities to, to do to do things maybe a little different. But uh, this year, we will be here to serve you Christmas Eve, but it will be just come and go communion from 5 until 6.30, okay? Thank you, Mark. Um, we also, uh, this, this evening, will be making a delivery um, to a, a family in the community um, that is in need. There's, uh, it, it's, it's such a blessing to look in the kitchen. There, there's food, there's gifts, there's, um, everything that the family could want or need um, back there. So we'll be, and, and that's in partnership with the, the Good Shepherd United Methodist Church um, out of Yukon. And so we'll be making that delivery at about four o'clock today. So because of that, we're going to change the time of youth today. We're going to meet at three o'clock to help stuff stockings, wrap a few more gifts, load everything into the, the vehicles to send out to that family. Um, so it'll be from about 3 to 4 or 4.30-ish kind of um, whenever everybody gets back from making that delivery. Um, so just if, before you leave here, if, if you're curious, take a peek in the kitchen to, to see the island just piled up with gifts and food for that family. Um, it's, it's a great thing. Any other announcements? I just want to add to yeah. that, uh, Charlotte Teal, who is on staff at Good Shepherd United Methodist Church, a good friend uh, for a long time, uh, ordained deacon, uh, contacted me about this family. The, the dad and the family live here. There's 10 family members living in a small home uh, out south of east of town and a little south. Uh, and he had been doing work in the Yukon community, helping them uh, recover from the ice storm, just helping homes. And, and so he had stopped by the... The church asking just for a little help with diapers. They've got two infant uh, children, uh, uh, young boys in the, in, the, in the home. And the church did what churches always do, which is to, to, to offer to do that, but to do more. Uh, but because they live here, Charlotte gave me a call and wanted to know if I could help with the delivery. Well, not only do we help with delivery, but we're going to help um, provide for them as well. So Good Shepherd Church provided, uh, they literally filled up the truck bed, my truck bed with diapers and, and, and gifts for the family. And then uh, we were providing food. So I, I went and bought uh, a bunch of groceries uh, on Friday when I got here. Uh, Sunday school classes are, are buying. We've had money given to support the family. Good Shepherd sent out a check for $150 to go to the family. We're matching that here from our church, from your generosity, from gifts that were given specifically to help this family and to take monies that we have given before that are in accounts for, for benevolence. But the other thing that's really important for me, uh, and, and it, it's, it, these are important dots to connect, is I spoke last week of, uh, of a young family that I uh, know and met in Hong Kong in 2013 for, uh, who live in North Miami Beach, Florida who I've been providing uh, very direct uh, pastoral care and spiritual direction for uh, as they're looking for a new church, new church home. They've been watching us online. Last week, they sent a check, their contribution to the, to the church for $3,000. Uh, 
which is an extraordinary gift for us and just an amazing gift that he's from North Carolina. She's a Singaporean Chinese. They met in California University. I met them in Hong Kong. They're now in North Miami Beach, Florida, and they sent a check to Cordell, Oklahoma. If, if the Lord's not behind that, I don't know who is. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I want to be able to communicate to Ted and Emily when I talk to them tonight, uh, I've got another two-hour session scheduled with them this evening, is I want them to understand that their gift here didn't just help keep the lights on, that their gift allowed us to make important payments toward our apportionments this year, but that some of their money goes directly to help this family. Emily is and has, has experienced what it means to immigrate twice. She's immigrated twice to the U.S., immigrated to Hong Kong. She knows what it's like as a Singapore and Chinese to live as an immigrant, and this is a family who have immigrated into the U.S. That's, that is the Christmas story. That is the Christmas story. So it's important for us, important for you as a church to understand that when God responds to us in these surprising, generous ways, we have responsibilities to, to use that in surprising, generous ways. And so it's, for me, it's just an absolute delight to, to, to be part of the wonder and the mystery and the majesty of how God works, that, that your church is, is now the church, at least for the time being, of this young couple in, in, in North Miami Beach, Florida, who watch our services and me preach and our worships because of what we're able to do online. And they want you to know that what you're doing here matters and it matters to them. And they want what you as a church to do here to matter to others. And if that's not Jesus at work, I, I just don't know who he is. So uh, I'm just, I'm really grateful for Ted and Emily for their generosity. And uh, I, I just want you to understand as a church how God works and what our responsibility is when, when those kinds of things happen. And that's just, that's just the beauty of Christmas. That's a Christmas miracle all the way around. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Mark. Any other announcements that need to be shared at this time? All right, well, let's gather together to worship. Let us pray. Oh God, sometimes we, we spend so much of our time looking off into the distance for a star on a distant horizon that somehow we can follow to a Christmas miracle that it becomes easy to miss the Christmas miracles that are happening right under our feet and right in front of us. For your faithfulness, for the wonder in all the ways in which you work in our lives and the lives of this church and through this church and the lives of others. As you connect need with those who can give. Help us to remember that every time that we, when we are giving out of our abundance to those in need, there's something that they always have in abundance that we need. And that is simply to be in the presence of joyful thanksgiving and thankfulness, appreciation, humility of receiving gifts that were so unexpected. Somewhere in all of that is the real meaning of, of Christmas, of watching Jesus show up brand new all over again. Being awestruck by those sudden on-time arrivals of grace and mercy and hope and joy. And as we are reminded as we light the candle today, how all of that brings us peace. For the Prince of Peace and for his love 
and for all that's possible through that love. Today, Lord, we offer our, our praise, our thanksgiving, our worship to you. May all that we do bring glory to you. Amen. Would you please stand as you're able and join me in the, in the call to worship? We live in a world of growing darkness. <coughs> we live in a world of growing darkness. We live in a slumbering world. Would you remain standing for our opening hymn on 218 in your Methodist hymnal, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Does anyone have any joys or concerns they would like to share with the congregation this morning? Some of you are already aware, but my brother Randy Robinson has been diagnosed with a very aggressive form of leukemia. He is in a facility right now receiving chemo. He will be there for four to six weeks for the first round, and we desperately all need your prayers. Are there others this morning? 
Um, I just want to say that Dan and I this week had a, had a wonderful blessing. Um, the church council voted to let Brooke, we paid Brooke at the catering thing to provide some meals for some of our volunteers and employees. And we delivered those Thursday to seven families, to people that volunteer during our service and some employees who maybe don't get thanked for what they do. Um, and we had a couple of employees who, when we were hurting for money, said, don't pay me. And um, that just tells me how much people love this church. And it was a blessing to be able to take that food and to thank these people for what they do. And I think we all need to do that maybe a little bit more because they give of their time and um, make this church work you know, so. Oh, and let's not forget to pray for Al White and his family. Are there others this morning? Well, I just want to give a campaign speech. If, if you read the beacon this week, you saw that Jeff Geronic filed for school board. And... I couldn't be prouder. There's no better feeling than to watch one of your former second graders grow up and file for <laughs> school board and, and feel secure that he will do a good job. Are there any others this morning? Lord, as we give thanks for the many joys among us, as we continue to be overwhelmed by the reality of the pandemic, what it reminds us of, though, is that that crisis, though worldwide and certainly being felt in our community here in Cordell, does not isolate us from other tragedies, and it doesn't prevent other tragedies from happening. Uh, we, we hear of uh, another family who is struggling under the diagnosis and all that the word cancer brings as a fear, as a horror, uh, all of the trepidation and the unknown that goes with that word. And it reminds us that, that tragedy is complex. It is layered. And sometimes tragedy stacks upon tragedy upon tragedy and it overwhelms our strength. It overwhelms our ability. It overwhelms our hope. But in our call to worship today, Lord, with these words, let us step into God's strength and hope. Let us be strengthened by the Spirit. So, Lord, let, it, let us not just say those words as words, but let us pray them fervently. And when our words fail us, hear the groanings of our spirit as even more fervent prayer for your strength, for your hope, for your comfort, for your peace, and for your trust, our trust in you, that you are at work in ways that we cannot see and cannot understand. Avail your strength to us of people who stumble in the darkness and stumble, stumble under the weight of all that is upon us. Help us. Help us, O oh God. And may we remember to give thanks in all things at all times. Now, Lord, hear the prayers of the faithful 
as we join all of our voices together, those in joy and those and in pain, as we say together the prayer that Christ taught us all to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, with the joy of the Lord, such as we can gather in today, let us stand and pass the peace and bless each other in the name of the Lord. Please. Blessings. God be with you all. Thank you. Please be seated. We live on the brink every day. We stand at the threshold between this world and the next one. We live and move between the ordinary and the divine, between the mundane and the mystery. Too often we forget to look up and see the angels hovering near us. We forget that the love we give is a sign of eternity. God with us right now. We forget that company is coming. Luke tells us that God's highest favor came to a young girl an ordinary girl. It could have been anyone's daughter, but the messenger of God came to a young girl in Nazareth 2,000 years ago, greeted her and said, the Lord is with you and you will give birth to God's son. What a gift and a promise, Emmanuel, God with us. We light four candles. Soon. We light four candles. The candles of hope, love, joy, and now, and now the candle of peace that comes because God is near. Even when we forget to listen, when we fail to lean into that presence, God remains as close as our own breath. This abiding truth in a confused and messy world is the peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace that knows that company is coming, the best company, God, who comes to us. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, LC. This morning we're going to go ahead and sing verses 4 and 5 of the Advent song on page 2090 in your faith we sing. <clears throat> Light the advent candle for, think of joy forevermore. Christ child in a stable born, gift of love that Christmas morn. Candle, candle burning bright, shining in the cold winter night candle candle burning bright fill our hearts with christmas light light the christmas candles now sing of donkey sheep and cow birthday candles for the king let the alleluia's ring candle candle burning bright shining in the cold winter night candle candle burning bright fill our hearts 
with Christmas light. Remembering our need to be generous as God is generous for us, we give thanks for all that you as a church continue to give to support the ministries of this church. We give thanks to all those who are giving so that the church and its ministries live on. Receive these, our gifts, O oh Lord. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Brooke. Let us pray. Lord, as we continue our worship now and the receiving of your word for us this day, may our hope be renewed in a God whose promises always come true. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke as we continue to hear Luke's telling of the Christmas narrative. We begin today with verse 57. We'll read through 66 and then over to verse 80. Here now the reading of God's Word this morning. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth, his mother, said, No, he is to be called John. And everyone said to her, But none of your relatives has his name. Then they began to motion to his father to find out what name Zechariah wanted to give him. Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. And then immediately, immediately, at once, Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue was freed. And he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors and all all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. And all who heard of these things pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. And then with verse 80, the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful verse, the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you have ever flown much, especially where you have flown to one airport and you had a connecting flight to another airport, you know the importance of having an on-time arrival. You can't get to the second leg of your trip if you don't get to the connecting gate on time, making sure to get yourself and your luggage all the way to the next flight. And if you've flown a lot, you certainly have seen folks in the airport at a dead run because they've landed at one end of the airport and their air next airplane leaves in five minutes and they're dead run from one terminal all the way to the next. They've usually got a kid or two in tow, kids crying, they're dragging luggage looking like their world is just about to crash. They're trying to get there. It's just a panic. It just, um, when you fly a lot, it's important that you have on-time arrival, so that, especially so that you can make your next flight. And your connecting flight is never in the gate next to the one you just land at. It just never works that way. Somehow it's always on the far side of the airport that you've landed on. 
And if you've flown enough, as I have, the next plane doesn't wait just because you're late. And when you miss that first plane, sometimes you've got to wait for hours, sometimes even the next day, to make a connecting flight. On-time arrivals are important. When I worked for the American Red Cross in Washington, D.C., I flew a lot. I was usually in some part of the country three weeks a month out of uh, Northern Virginia. Occasionally, we flew on Southwest Airlines, and there was a time for a while there where it was a point for American Air, uh, Southwest Airlines that when you landed, the pilot would come on and greet you and welcome you to the, the new town and would say, another, air, another on-time arrival. Thank you for flying Southwest Airlines. For a while, they were the number one airline in the, in the business for on-time arrivals. Now they're fifth. Hawaiian Airlines is now first. Their on-time arrival means that 87% of the time they're on time, and on time for the airlines means within 15 minutes of the time they were supposed to be there. So 87% of the time they're on time, even if they're 15 minutes late, every time. <laughs> now how, how much could we get away with that at work if we showed up 87% of the time, 15 minutes late, burst in the door and said, another on-time arrival? We wouldn't make probably our second paycheck. It's not the way the world works. It's not the way it's supposed to work. It's not the way that God works. So we continue this week with the Christmas story as told through the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Matthew has its own telling. Details are different. But we are in Luke this year. And in Luke, the Christmas story could be, could be told as from the perspective of another on-time arrival, twice. And today we're talking about one of them, and that's the birth of John. The first on-time arrival is that of the first pregnancy, that of Elizabeth, who gives birth now to John the Baptist. The second on-time arrival is one we will, we will celebrate on Thursday, as churches all around the world do, celebrating the birth of Jesus, whose on-time arrival came just three months after John's. We began the Christmas story in Luke with a foretelling of this pregnancy to Elizabeth and Zechariah about her son, who became John the Baptist. Remembering that part of the story, we remember that Zechariah had been serving faithfully as the priest as, as, um, as determined by Lot. It happened to be his day, probably his only day across his whole life to have served in the temple that day. Serving in the temple, he was praying, laying on his face, and the angel Gabriel showed up. Scared him to death, as we know that always happens, saying, do not be afraid. And then delivers a word, that word Rima that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. Spoke a word over, over Zechariah that he and Elizabeth, though very, very old, though carrying the cultural shame of not having a child, being childless, would, would bear a son. In our modern, uh, modern translations, it just says that Elizabeth and, 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 and Zechariah were, were old. In the King James Version, uh, it, it has a different way of saying it. It says that John, I mean, that Elizabeth and, and Zechariah were well stricken, well stricken in their years. Now, I'm not saying that any of you are well stricken yet, <laughs> but we're all on our way, aren't we? And then we know what happened because Zechariah doubted. He was struck mute and he remained silent through the entire pregnancy. Next sermon was the foretelling of Mary's pregnancy. We talked about pregnant waiting, that active waiting. It's not a passive waiting. It's a, it's a preparation in the waiting. There's a tension in that waiting. You know, three months ago, before I got here, there was tension and preparation waiting for the new pastor to come, wondering who he would be and whether he would care for the church. And now here you are, just three months later, the exact time difference between the birth of John and the birth of Jesus, three months. Here you are, in tension and preparation again, as you prepare for Pastor Mike Laird to start his ministry in two weeks. That's the kind of active preparation, that's the kind of tension that Advent is to be about. It is that time of waiting. 
but we're waiting, not passively. And we're not waiting for Jesus to come, not the first time. We're certainly not waiting for Jesus to come the second time, not the last time. We don't think that's necessarily going to happen three days from now, five days from now. But we certainly expect that Jesus is going to come to us in a very real way, some, some, some way that's new to us, in a fresh way that, that Jesus just appears new again. But it's not just waiting actively, participating in the waiting during Advent. As I spoke about last week, Advent is marked by God's hope. And it's an, it's an, an expectant hope, a very real hope that things will get better. After all that 2020 has brought us, aren't we in need? Aren't all of us in need for a real hope? that things will really get better. And the sooner, the better. It's hard for me as a Cowboy fan to say the sooner, the better. <laughs> I just didn't roll off my tongue right. We just hope it gets here fast. I'll say it that way. Before I got here three months ago, there was hope that things at the church would get better than they have been. But you had hope when I got here. It was here. You had hope when I got here. You have hope now. Maybe a little more hope. Maybe it's a different kind of hope. But you were never without hope. And your new pastor, Mike Laird, coming in two weeks will bring a different kind of hope than I can bring because he's got different gifts and different graces. He's a, he's a performance pastor. He sings and plays guitar and uses his music as part of his ministry. And I think that'll be just a delight for this church. I told Mike when I was talking to him on the phone the other day that I told the Lord a long time ago that I'd give him both my legs below the knees if he'd give me a voice to sing and the ability to play guitar. I've still got both of my feet. I still can't sing. <laughs> but Mike can, and that's part of the ministry that he will bring, uh, part of the joy that he will bring and the gift that he will bring to this church. And that's important to us. We, uh, as, as uh, Charlene reminded us of the value of thanking those who've helped us uh, this week, uh, one of our treasured saints of the church, and that Hill has tendered her resignation and, and won't be playing for us again. She's just at that point where she needs to step away. So it's, a, it's timely that somebody like Mike Laird is showing up that brings his gifts of music. And we know that Judy will continue to support the church from time to time with her great gifts. And Judy's been one of the, the great blessings uh, that I've, I've had the opportunity to meet. It took me a while to figure out her sense of humor, but I found out about it this week. And... Uh, <laughs> Some of you participated in, in one of the most ridiculous text conversations I've ever had this week. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was just, it was, it was not borderline ridiculous, it was completely ridiculous. Um, and, and, and Judy just let me have it with both barrels and I loved it. I just absolutely loved it. So I, I think that one of the things that I see in this church is, is I've seen hope become different. I hear you laughing in a way I didn't hear you laugh when I got here. There's the beginnings of, of joy in this church again. It's not just hope that's been birthed in this, this church. I think it's joy. And with the joy of seeing the Lord at work and seeing all the possibilities of, of future ministry and, and vitality in this church and possibilities and seeing just the the divinely weird stuff that God does by connecting people that I met in Hong Kong that's supporting this church now, that's allowing us to meet the needs of a family. Somewhere in the middle of that, there's just, there's a peace that has come. It's going to be okay. Somehow, it's just going to be all right. And that brings a peace. It's a needed and necessary peace. And I think it's not, not coincidental today that it's the candle of peace that we light because 
it took love first, the love that you had for this church of keeping things together. It took hope for new possibilities, joy. But all that together brings us peace, peace that comes from the trust that God is actually at work and making a difference not only in the lives of this church, but in the lives of, of each of you as you continue to serve and, and gift this church with your gifts of ministry, your gifts of faithfulness. Last week, an extraordinary story. Mary, pregnant now, probably about three months along, goes and visits her relative, Elizabeth, certainly an older relative. Elizabeth is about six months along, and as soon as Mary walks in the room, it's not Elizabeth who jumps for joy. It's the infant child in her own womb, John, who's six months old in the womb, leaps for joy at the presence of this tiniest measure of joy sitting in the womb of Mary who walked in the room. What an extraordinary expression, a treasured story to pass down to us about the kind of hope that leaps forward. And that's the kind of hope that this church must have. It must have a hope that's leaping forward into a vital future. It's a different future. It's not the future that you once had. The church isn't the same from year to year. It never is the same from year to year. It's always a little bit different. But each year we always have that opportunity to start fresh, to start new. New beginnings, new possibilities, new hopes, new dreams. And that's where I see this church at. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing as a pastor to witness. And in just a few weeks, as I begin my new ministry in Lindsay, I'll be able to give a witness about this church and your faithfulness to church who will need a message of hope. But of a hope that became true and I've seen that in this church. And I'll tell your story for as long as I live. And as long as I have an opportunity to share the story of your faithfulness and your hope, I'll tell that story. Giving a witness to your faithfulness and the joyful, faithful, sometimes hard work that you've done. The thing this church did, which Advent calls us to, is to not be passive in the waiting. You waited actively. You participated in the waiting. That pregnant waiting, that time of expectant hope, because those two things always go hand in hand. The pregnant waiting and the expectant hope, it's not one or the other. It's always both at the same time. The baby John and his mother, Elizabeth's womb, shows us that better way. Nothing passive about what John was doing. Even from the womb, John is active, leaping toward hope, that expectant hope that points the way from where we are to the time when the hope in its fullness will come to be. That's what expectant hope does. It points toward the promised time when hope comes into its fullness, when we're delivered from whatever is holding us back, from whatever is holding us captive. Hope is a promise, and it helps us muddle forward from our present circumstances toward a brighter day and a better life. And hope in its fullness, when fully delivered, is always right on time. And hope is what sets us free. Our pregnant waiting is filled with expectant hope that what God promises, God will deliver on time, right on time, every time. Not 87.4% of the time and 15 minutes late, but on time, all the time, every time. The story today is about one of God's promises coming true and what God promised, God delivered another on-time arrival right on time. John arrives right on time. He had to. He had to come before Jesus. That was his job, was to come before Jesus and to prepare the people for the way, for the way of the coming of the Lord. He had to come first. 
He had to come first. His life work was to prepare a way for the coming of the Lord. What God promised Elizabeth months ago comes into its fullness in the story we hear today. What God promised Elizabeth, God delivered, and the baby John is born right on time. And we recall the context of that promise. Zechariah had been struck mute. And then finally, after all those long barren years and these long months of a pregnancy of a woman who was well stricken in years, John is born. And they don't name him right away because you're not named until your eighth day when you're dedicated at the temple, the day for males in which they're presented at the temple and they're also circumcised. So after these long years and these long last months, Zechariah and Elizabeth present John, the infant, who's not named at this point, he's just a baby boy, present him at the temple to be dedicated and circumcised. It's that important time in the life of a young male child in which the sign of the Jew is given to him, that he's part of a covenant family, part of God's chosen family. So the ceremony is also the moment in which the child is named. And so they formally asked, what is the name to be given to the child? And they fully expected the child to be named Zechariah because his dad's name was Zechariah. And da Zechariah's name, dad's name would have been Zechariah. And everyone before them would have been named Zechariah. And so they fully expected this child to be named Zechariah. When I worked in Washington, D.C., one of the uh, young men that I worked with, a really, really gifted, 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 really bright, bright, bright young man, was a, was a young Muslim man. His name was Muhammad. Um, and uh, back in the day when I, I didn't visit the church very often, didn't visit the church at all, um, when we went on business trips, as often happened, uh, there were also often visits to, uh, to, the, to the bar. And, and, and Muhammad would always make a, 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 a bar bet. And some of you men know what that, that means. He would always bet people around him that he could name all of his fathers back for 10 generations. Of course, nobody can remember your, your father's names for 10 generations because they, they always bet him. And then he would go, Muhammad, 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 ten times. Because everybody before him had been named Muhammad. That's the culture of the people there, Muslim or Jew. You're named after your father. And so here we are. We have Zechariah delivering his son, expecting him to be named Zechariah. And Elizabeth says, no, his name is to be John. Well, they resist. They rebel. No, you can't name him John. There's nobody in your family that's ever been named John. His name's supposed to be Zechariah. So they look over at, at Zechariah and what's his name supposed to be? Well, Zechariah can't speak. So Zechariah writes, and he writes on a tablet and says his name is John. And the moment that he says, writes that, not says it, the moment that he writes it and confirms what Gabriel had promised, Zechariah's mouth is opened. And the first thing that Zechariah does is he gives praise to the God that had been faithful to him. And he gives us the word that's called the Song of Zechariah in verse 68 in Luke. Luke 1. The first thing out of his mouth after these long months of silence were these words, Blessed be the Lord God. Of Israel. For he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. 
in holiness and in righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, speaking about his own son, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of his salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins and by the tender mercy of our God. The dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in the darkness and sit in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. You church, your God has come to you as you sat in the darkness and in the shadow of death and delivered you into the way of peace. Praise be to God. Why was Zechariah able to sing a song of praise? Because in spite of his speechlessness, in spite of all of his doubt, Zechariah chose to believe that God's word to him would come, come true. He was trusting and obedient, even in his doubt. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Zechariah chose to believe, he chose to trust, he chose to be obedient, he chose to be faithful over those long, difficult, and silent months, even through the limitations. And because he believed, and because he trusted, and because he was obedient, because he was faithful, Zechariah and Elizabeth were rewarded. What was promised was delivered another on-time arrival. What God promised Zechariah and Elizabeth, God delivered. God promised the impossible that Zechariah and the barren Elizabeth, though very very stricken in years, would become parents of their own son. And what God promised, God delivered. And the son arrived right on time, and they named him John, and Zechariah got his speech back, and he gave praise to the God who gave him the child. What God promised, God delivered. In those long, hard months spent in pregnant waiting and expectant hope, God delivered another on-time arrival right on time. What a powerful witness this must have been to Mary. We can almost certainly believe that Mary would have been there as a relative. She would have been there at the temple. If not at the temple, then she would have heard the story soon. What a powerful witness. Mary, just the exact opposite of who Elizabeth was. There Elizabeth was well stricken in years. And here Mary was a young teenager, barely old enough to have a child. And both were pregnant, both in probable circumstances. And just a few months later, after John was born, Mary would participate in her own on-time arrival as God's own son, an infant child who would become our Savior, our Lord of Lords, and our King of Kings was born. For now, Mary waits. She waits for God to deliver. And we know how the story ends. For on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day around the world, churches and families will gather in their own way, in their own place, in all the ways that they can, and remember the birth of an infant child, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, a Savior who came as an infant born in a manger, light of the world, hope of the world, a small infant child. What God promised Mary, God delivered. What God promised to the whole world, God delivered another on time arrival. God promised, had promised for years and years, for hundreds of years, that there would be a Messiah, an anointed one, who would come as a Savior into the world. And as God promised, God delivered. And he got, God delivered in a stable in Bethlehem, this tiny town in nowhere Palestine. And God can deliver in the middle of nowhere in Palestine and Judea. Guess what? He can deliver in the middle of nowhere out here in Cordell. It has and is and always will because that's what God does. 
Through Jesus, God did a new thing for the world. Three, and then three months ago, God did a new thing in this church. And three months later, the same length of time between the birth of John and the birth of Jesus, God is getting ready to do a new thing again in the Cordell Church. And it will be another on-time delivery, right on time. Just as John was due, as, just as John did for Jesus. All that I was to do was to prepare the way for the coming of your new pastor. That was my job before I got here. It's been my job every minute that I've been here was to prepare you for a new pastor. And that has been my job. Not to prepare you for my ministry, but to prepare you for Mike Laird's ministry. And three months ago, he didn't know it. I didn't know it. You didn't know it. We didn't know he was coming. Nobody did. But the Lord did. And somewhere in the... And the way God works and His intent for churches and intent for your church, Pastor Mike Laird is going to show up right on time, and he will be another on-time arrival. But you know what? So will you for him. You are his first full-time church. This will be the first time that he and his wife have left the safety net of their long professional careers to be full-time in ministry. So you're showing up as his on-time arrival, too. That's the wonder and the mystery of all of this. You will be here right on time for him and for Melinda as they start their new life among you. So God is doing a new thing again in this church, just as God has done for almost 130 years. 130 years ago, God showed up and started to do a new thing here in Cordell. Before it was called New Cordell. When it was Old Cordell. And did a new thing and made sure that there was a Methodist church here. And 130 years later, almost, here it is. And you have all the reason to believe in years and years of ministry to come. Because you've been faithful. But it's because God has been faithful through people like you for 130 years. But just as God has done for this church, specifically, God is doing some new things in some of you. Some of you are at new places in your lives of faith. Some of you are at new places and times in all that you are doing and have done for the Lord. Some of you are in your personal time of pregnant waiting and expectant hope. God promises. And what God promises, God delivers. See, here's the tricky part about God. God does, doesn't typically deliver babies that are full grown. God delivers babies. God delivers things in their infancy. Mike's ministry will start here in two weeks in its infancy. Your job is to help his ministry here grow into its fullness and its maturity. And he is to be a partner with you in helping your church, you and your ministries, grow from its infancy of where it is now into the fullness of what it's to become over the next few years. It's a partnership, hand in hand, with God over it all. Some of you, some of you are in specific times of new things and new times. New ventures, new adventures. Just like God did first for Elizabeth and later for Mary, what God promised, God delivered. But remember, God delivered to Elizabeth a gift in its infancy, and it was left to Elizabeth and Zechariah to raise what God delivered to Mary in infancy, Mary and Joseph had to raise. I believe, I believe with all my heart, with all my heart, that God is making new promises to this church right here, right now. As we breathe, there are new promises being made to this church and to you, and through you. 
But God promises, God delivers. I believe that God has promised something specific for some of you that just as Gabriel spoke a word over Mary, spoke a word, a rima, as we called it a few weeks ago, I believe that God is doing the same to you. I believe that God is speaking a rima into your lives these days and that God is giving you something in its infancy that is up to you now to raise like Elizabeth and Mary in from its infancy into its fullness. So it brings the question now, will you be faithful to raise up into fullness of maturity this new thing that God is doing in this church, in you? Will you be faithful as a church? And will you individually be faithful to all that God is trying to do to you and through you on behalf of others? I don't know what God is up to. I won't be here to see the details. But I'll hear. We all have a way of staying connected. I won't be here to watch the glory of all of that unfold, but I'll know. I'll hear. But the Spirit is alive in this church. The Spirit of a living, ever-creating, always-healing God is at work in this church right now as we sit and breathe. And I know I'm not the only one that feels that. I know I'm not even the only one who's talking about it because I hear it from some of you. I know the Spirit is stirring. Glory. Well, there's a lot that none of us know about the details of all that will happen. What we can take away from our reading of Luke's telling of the circumstances of Christ's birth is this, when God makes a promise, whether to a church or to us individually, when God makes a promise, God delivers. We may be speechless for a while. We may, like Zechariah, sputter and stutter ourselves into silence. But we must not forget that our first response when our speech comes back to us is to give God the glory. For what God promises, God delivers, and our first response is to praise God, giving God the glory for this new thing that God has created and delivered. Because every time, every time God promises, there's going to be another on-time arrival, and our first response always and must forever shall be, praise God from whom all blessings flow. When I was at Bixby as an associate pastor, still in seminary, still very young at all of this, still... sputtering and stuttering at times, trying to figure out what it actually means to me that God would call somebody like me to be a pastor. In those early days of watching my gifts in discernment and spiritual direction and spiritual mission form, as I, even before I had started the, the three years of training to become a spiritual director, I began to realize that people had been seeking me out for specific counsel and perspective in their lives. Even without much training, but I had faithfulness even when I didn't have training to just do what I could. A lady from the church came to me one day and she said, Mark, I've had a dream and I don't know what it means. She had been speaking about, for a while, that she thought she was being called into ministry. She was already a lay leader of the church. She and her husband both were extraordinary leaders in, in the mission work of the church. But she felt like God was trying to elevate her into something different, something new. But like all of us at the time, God doesn't give us a billboard with all the details on it. He just says, go or follow me or come where I'm calling you. And so you sputter and you stutter and you stumble and you... you, you, you you muddle forward into, into all of that. And she came to me one day and said, Mark, I've had this really kind of a strange dream, and I think it has something to do with my call. I said, well, tell me about it. She said, well, somewhere in the dream, I realized that I was holding hands with this tiny little girl. And everywhere I went, this little girl was hand in hand with me in the dream. But I didn't know who she was. I just knew that I was supposed to hold her hand and she was supposed to hold mine. And she said, Mark, I, I think maybe what that means is God's calling me into children's ministry. And 
maybe. But in dreams, God tends to not speak to us in ways that are literal, but in symbolic ways. And in my discernment, what I told her that day was, that may be true. We don't know the specifics of what God is calling you to do yet. But in my discernment, what I think that child represents is this new thing that God has given you in its infancy, which is your ministry. It's a child. And your job now is to raise this child into its maturity, whatever it turns out to be. And we never know when our children are four of who they're going to be in their 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. We just know it's our job to raise them to get to the point where they can begin to make those decisions for themselves, for their fullness to be revealed. And that's what I think it was for her. It's just it was, that was, that was that's this new dream that God was dreaming in her, that it was for her and been brought to her in its infancy. But it was up to her now to raise into its maturity. Here's what I think for this church. Now, here's what I know. As much as I can know, as much as a pastor can never know anything. I believe, I trust, I know in, in the heart of hearts, my heart of hearts, that God is dreaming new dreams. Not just in this church, but for this church. That God's dreaming new dreams, not just in this church or for this church, but new dreams and the people of this church. He's dreaming new dreams for the people of church that through you, others' lives will be saved and their lives will be changed and transformed. That God is bringing things to you as he does at Christmas, things in its infancy. He says, here, I give my baby to you. Will you raise my baby? And love it. And help it find its voice. In the season of pregnant waiting and expectant hope, as God makes a promise for another delivery, what we know is that what God promises and God has promised to be faithful to you. That what God promises, God will deliver. And somewhere, someday, somehow, for this church and for each of you, there will be more on-time arrivals. And your job is to say, praise God. Amen and amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn this morning, O Come All You Faithful, on page 234. Ryan, can you turn up the hymnal plus just a little bit, please? Thank you.
This hymn says that we too will thither. Have you ever thithered before? <laughs> How do you know you haven't? I was kind of hoping you was going to sing in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I've sung it in Latin, but I didn't do <laughs> There's kind of an amazing thing in that first line there in Latin. Underworth, underneath the word joyful, the, the, the Latin there is, is the first verse in Latin. The word joyful in Latin is laity. Hmm. Hmm. In spiritual direction, we call that the holy hump. <laughs> because it's an aha moment. It's an epiphany. This isn't the laity. <laughs> the laity are not Eeyores. Laity are supposed to be tiggers of the world. Bouncing in joy, springing forth all over the place. I think that's what thither means. To spring forth in joy. So go in peace. God's peace. Not just in peace, but as St. Francis calls us to be, to be instruments of that peace. Now go. Zither. And be joyful. Amen. Thank you, Brooke.